Far off in the distant lands to the east lies Nippon, Ind, Koresh, and Cathay. Each one a mythical land that has had small references and passages here and there throughout the Warhammer lore. As of the announcement of Total War Warhammer 3, we will now, for the first time, see a fully realized Cathay as one of the starting factions of Game 3. This is an exciting prospect, as the closest thing we've gotten to an actual army was a converted army by Dave Taylor back in White Dwarf number 314. With the announcement, it got me wondering, what would a Cathay army look like in the scope of a Total War Warhammer game? In today's video, we'll be exploring just that. I think it's really easy to quickly dismiss a Cathay army as simply an Empire clone with a Total War Three Kingdoms twist to it, but I assure you, that will not be the case. All the factions for Game 3 are going to be larger than life as far as their rosters go. Kislev has got a ton of unit diversity between hybrid units, monstrous cavalry options and bear cav, and a lot of old staples in artillery pieces and state troops. You can find my army list video for them in the upper right corner right now. Chaos Demons have a terrifying panoply to choose from across mortal and demon units, each one allied to their respective gods. Then Ogre Kingdoms and Chaos Dwarfs, whichever one is the pre-order DLC, will have a very wild set of units as well. So, it should stand to reason that Cathay will have an equally as exciting possible army list, and I'm going to show you what that might look like. I'll be using concept sketches by Ruo Yu and Kobo Yu. Both gentlemen have shared their pictures all over the Total War subreddit, and I think they nail the Cathayan aesthetic. So a huge shout out to them. Respective links can be found in the description, so please, please, please go and check them out, as well as Kobo Yu, uh, who has the Reddit handle of Furious Ming. You can find out all of his individual posts on all the art and the lore that he kind of supports them with. It's really, really interesting. So the way I'm going to structure this video is by first going through the Legendary Lords. We'll discuss four possible characters, as well as their starting locations, faction names, heroes, melee infantry, ranged infantry, cavalry, artillery, monstrous infantry, monstrous cavalry, monsters, and then lastly we'll go into a little bit about Lores of Magic before we close out our video, talking about um, any kind of other additional Cathay stuff. You can quickly navigate to each one of these sections with the chapters denoted in the timeline. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly shout out the link to my Nexus storefront in the description, so if you have not yet pre-purchased Warhammer 3, you can do so through Nexus. They have an awesome relationship with the developers, getting Steam keys directly from them and giving them to you. So they then give the content creator, myself, 50% of the margin that they negotiate with each company. So it's an amazing way to help out the channel. So thank you very much if you choose to use the link. But let's get started on our Cathay Armulus speculation. Starting with the Legendary Lords. And the Legendary Lords for Cathay are both spicy and diverse. I mean, we're talking a lot of variety across a possible shape-shifting lord, a semi-monstrous leader, a cultist, and a vampire. Just a ton of different options for the type of playthrough you have in mind. Honestly, I find that to be an amazing way to open up this video because the legendary lords reflect the same kind of high variance we might expect in a possible roster for Cathay with standard foot soldiers all the way up to massive moving bronze statues. If the Tomb Kings and Empire rosters were combined, you'd probably get something similar to Cathay. And when it comes to discussing possible starting locations, we'll be using an amazing map created by members of the Chinese Warhammer community. They flew out to Creative Assembly's headquarters in Horsham and presented the map to both Games Workshop and Creative Assembly during the promotional run of Three Kingdoms to help ensure cultural authenticity of 3K. And honestly, it's one of the best maps to date of Grand Cathay, and it will be a reference point throughout the video. You'll find the appropriate links to this information in the description as credit is due for this monumental undertaking. Well, let's get into each Lord now and how some of their mechanics might shake out, starting with the leader of Cathay itself. Far to the north of Cathay, at the foot of the Great Bastion, the Warhammer World's equivalent to the Great Wall of China, lies the capital of Grand Cathay itself, the marvelous city of Weijin. This is reputed to be the largest and most beautiful city in the entire world. Now that could be open to conjecture as trade to Cathay from the old world perspective is rather limited and also quite recent. Needless to say, on the only race aside from the Skaven that probably have a good understanding of Cathay 
are the High Elves, and good luck having them admit to anything more splendid than their own constructs. But that's, I mean, neither here nor there. For Weijin is the seat of power for Grand Cathay and where the Dragon Throne resides, and the individual who sits upon that throne is our first legendary lord, the Immortal Dragon Emperor. Now, I can go on and on about collecting the Dragon Balls as a side quest in the game to be able to activate his dragon form, but that would be too cheap and too obvious of a joke. So we'll move on to this character instead. Now, not much is known about the Celestial Dragon Emperor outside of his original birthplace being Namek. Okay, sorry, <laughs> just the one joke then, just the one joke. But seriously, there, there's not a large chronicle to go off of. Uh, most information is gleaned from small excerpts from the Winds of Magic, rule books, army books, and Warhammer RPG supplements. And that's true of Cathay as a whole. And there is a particularly interesting bit of information from the book The Great Maw by L.J. Goulding about how the ogres were at one time sworn soldiers of the Celestial Dragon Emperor. And after the ogres were caught eating children in the fields of Cathay, the emperor cursed them all with the eternal hunger that plagues the ogres to this day. Now, mechanically, I could see the Dragon Emperor as a very interesting character, being akin to, say, Karl Franz when he's on foot, or at least on a Kirin. Um, more on those later. So a very glass cannony style character, dealing out a lot of damage, but also having the ability to buff the soldiers around him. Remember, this is an individual that represents both the spiritual and civic head of the entire empire. He would absolutely have an effect on his men. Thusly, I'd say the faction name could be something simple like Grand Cathay or Celestial Empire, essentially acting as the quote-unquote vanilla Cathay experience, focusing more on buffing up bannermen and Celestial Guard, the elite cast of soldiers. But through all of that, I think that the Emperor would also help out the bonuses, buffs, and other passives assigned to the Celestial Dragons as the Emperor himself can turn into one, making him the first lord outside of Malice Darkblade to have a full-on transformation mechanic, something that would be absolutely incredible. Now, as far as the faction-specific mechanics, we need to go back to the location of Wei Jin and its River of Souls. This River of Souls acts as a means of transportation, or at least communion, into the underworld, granting the traveler information of the unknown. And I think that this blends very nicely with the Stygian voices mechanic we got in the Total War Troy campaign with Aeneas. The ability to discover more ancient heroes, learning from them, and granting additional bonuses to the faction. Think of how awesome that could be. Uh, traversing portions of the world to then tap into the River of Souls to talk to, say, a Narian if you make it to Ulthuan, or Sigmar if you go to Altdorf. And perhaps there is a quest mechanic behind it, you know, where you don't need to physically go to these locations. You just need to get three tiers of artifact, uh, common, uncommon, and rare. Each one is, would, or I guess could be received in a different manner. Common could be acquired from winning a battle or, or raiding the desired faction. Um, uncommon could be received by taking a city of the de desired faction. And then rare could be rewarded for wounding a legendary lord or perhaps even destroying a minor faction of the same parent faction. So, for example, like just killing Talabuckland and rather than killing the Empire Actual or Altdorf. And this is all spitballing, but I think that this could be a really fun mechanic for the Celestial Empire. And another d idea I had would be to have a mechanic similar to Alariel, where you have to hold portions of the Great Bastion. And if you have, say, the lands right inside the Bastion itself and right outside, you get more bonuses than if you did not having any of those three regions. Sort of how Alariel grants bonuses if elves control all of Inner Ulthuan, Outer Ulthuan, and Ulthuan as a whole. Swinging on to our next character is the Monkey King. And that was about as good of a joke as the Namek one earlier, but the Monkey King is where we start to get into some of the really interesting tidbits of Cathay, where it's not just simply a different human faction. The Monkey King is an interesting individual. He seized power in 2377 of Grand Cathay. And to put that into a frame of reference, Karl Franz's coronation is in the year 2502. Then he installed warlord Kishik of Clan Eshin as an advisor, starting trade with the Skaven Empire. So that's a huge curveball because this opens a door to the Monkey King having Clan Eshin 
but we'll get back to that. Now, it's conflicting since he supposedly operates at the same time as the Celestial Dragon Emperor, but resides in the Mountains of Heaven along with the other monkey warriors. There's also an existing relationship between him and Diecha Ing, the next lord to talk about. Well, a poor relationship, but what ones aren't nowadays. As far as playstyle for the Monkey King, I could see him being similar to Aranessa Saltspite, an agile lord that can deal a lot of damage, but has ways of escaping combat or locking his foe down to deliver the killing blow. I mean, I can't help but picture Jet Li in the movie Forbidden Kingdom, which is both good and terrible, but an acrobatic character that kicks and leaps around, using his staff to clear space like Snicket's tail storm ability. Just a very mobile character. For his mount options, Kobol Yu drew him on a disc of Zinch, and it's pretty goddamn rad. In Chinese mythology, the Monkey King is usually zipping around on a little Nimbus cloud, so either one really works for me. Zinch isn't out of the question, but it might conflict with the Dian Ching as far as offering unique mounts. Mechanically, I think you can really have a lot of fun with the relationship between the Skaven and the Monkey King. Remember, Clan Eshin learns their assassin ways from Cafe, so having them being at least, you know, an ensemble to the narrative of Grand Cafe is really an awesome touch. The Monkey King faction could be a hybrid faction, introducing Skaven Slave and Eshin units into the roster, subbing out some of the, say, Celestial Guard or more elite human based units of Grand Cafe in lieu of a higher Skaven and Monkey Warrior presence. Even further, giving Heaven's Equal, a proposed name for the Monkey King's faction, an intricate Skaven spy network would be a lot of fun. Marco Polare talks about having seen a Skaven undercity underneath Wei Jin, adding more fuel to this speculation. I just really love the Skaven to have a larger part in a faction-specific mechanic. Since the Skaven have been there for thousands of years, uh, maybe this spy network can give you exact garrison information. If the siege system is indeed reworked in Game 3, this could be invaluable info. Either popping open doors, sabotaging artillery placements, any number of little tricks. This would, of course, cost some form of currency, but the options are limitless here. It could be similar to Deathmatcher's Snicket mechanic, only more fleshed out and standardized since it has the backing of an entire empire that doesn't need to solely operate within the shadows. Now, of all the lords we've talked about so far, Dian Ching has the highest possibility of being in the game because of the Warhammer community post on the day of the Game Through reveal, stating, Devout readers of the Black Library books may remember a certain sorcerer from Cathay in 1991's Beast in Velvet. The sorcerer in question is Big Daddy Dian Ching here, and he offers a very interesting twist compared to the previous two lords we've discussed. If the Emperor is a warrior, dealing damage and shapeshifting, and the Monkey King is another agile glass cannon style character, Dian Ching would be our first pure caster character for Cathay. Also, since he is a Chaos Cultist of Zinch, he would leverage a new lore of magic in the lore of Zinch. This is a lore that would be exclusive to Chaos for the exception of Dian Ching, allowing for a lot of really cool flavor sprinkled into Cathay. For mounts, slapping him on a horse as a Base mount is a pretty big no-brainer, but then moving him to that disc of Zinch would be an awesome endgame mount, giving him the ability to navigate around the battlefield quickly and possibly give him a passive regeneration to his winds of magic. Lore-wise, though, he operates at around the same time as the Monkey King, and the two have a pretty antagonistic relationship, Dian Ching often remarking in the Vampire Genevieve novels how incompetent or stupid the Monkey King is. Now, as far as mechanics go, the Celestial Cult of the Purple Hand, or the Invisible Empire, both are solid working names for Dian Ching's faction. I see another dual faction like we've gotten so much in the latter days of Total War Warhammer 2, only this time adding Zinch demons into the repertoire of the Sorcerer's Army. It doesn't even need to be a wide range, maybe just the Flamers, Screamers, and Chariots to add some variety to the list. Then there could be a heavy emphasis on Purple Hand cultists, elementals, and their master maguses of the Qi, Qi on Qi. Units that are more aligned with the Purple Hand, the cult that worships Zinch, and fit into the overall theme of Dian's faction. Speaking of a faction, I think his faction-specific mechanic is going to depend very heavily on what or how the Demons of Chaos faction mechanics are going to work. If Zinch as some, has some sort of ability to influence or corrupt a city from within, then I could see that being a part of the Invisible Empire's mechanic in Cathay. 
in the Vampire Genevieve book, Silver Nails, the Pagoda of Sien Sin is talked about uh, pretty extensively as a source of power or at least channeling for Dien. So it'd be interesting if you could infuse it with warp stone or chaos energy to unlock quote unquote levels of the pagoda, each one granting maybe uh, a blessed spawning style unit that are stronger versions of normal units, uh, faction buffs, unit buffs, upkeep reductions, etc, etc. Sort of a driving force where the warp stone is located in locations that the Monkey King and his Skaven allies have housed it, bringing that Monkey King relationship back into the play as a narrative for the campaign. And lastly, for a starting location, I think this would be the Wayward Lord, starting out in the Darklands rather than Grand Cathay itself, since there's lots of lore that talks of him doing his dark bidding far from the cities of Cathay, where he can quote unquote cast off his dark steepled hood. And typically we get one or two lords of a faction that start further from the heart of the faction as a bigger challenge, and this would be that guy. Our last legendary lord to discuss is Hrakti, or Prince Jian Hafeng, either one. Uh, the prince would be a jade vampire, while Hrakti would be the primogenitor of the bloodline. We've done a video on the Lost Bloodlines that you can find linked in the upper right corner, but there are five main vampire bloodlines in the Blood Dragons, Necrarch, Von Karsteins, Lahamians, and Shogoi. The lost, or sorry, the two lost bloodlines are the Jade Blooded and the Mot Masi, the latter being located in the roiling sand dunes of Araby, while the Jade Blooded have infiltrated the ruling caste and aristocracy of Grand Cathay. This is where Harakati comes in. Again, you have two choices here, in the prince or Hrakti himself. Hrakti fled to Cathay with a dozen, or in, in quotes here, a dozen of his most skilled courtiers, scribes, investigators, guards, and torturers after the fall of Lamia. So his presence in Grand Cathay makes plenty of sense, as he had been journeying there far before he even received the elixir of life. Prince Jean Ha Feng was gifted blood from Neferata and was taking it in small doses during a period of particular civil unrest in Cathay that he manipulated to overthrow the emperor, his father, and then disappear into the chaos of the civil war. So both make for strong options of Lord with a ton of character behind them. My opinion though, I'd love to see Harakti uh, because that would be another head of a vampire bloodline like Vlad von Karstein that we've had in Total War, uh, for the exception of a hopeful and hopeful eventual Neferata at the Silver Pinnacle. Either way, the playstyle could be along the lines of a Manfred, an individual that is tankier simply by virtue of being a vampire, but also have access to the typical lores of magic as a hybrid caster. Now, the other idea I had in mind was that of a support character, less of a defensive one. In the lore, it talks about how the Jade-Blooded are a particularly old vampires, uh, having aged significantly and riddled with the same diseases and addictions that plagued Herakati. The lore paints a pretty vivid picture here. Their eyes cloud over, their skin grows translucent, and their blood has become an ooze of bright green ichor. Global Yu has drawn these guys being carried in a Jade palanquin, and I think that's a really cool approach. Go with a more support unit, that debuffs the enemy and significantly buffs your troops, relying on cheaper undead hordes and perhaps brainwashed bannermen to get the job done with a heavy emphasis on jade cultists and jade zealots, uh, you know, both chaff and elite units respectively. Now, taking it one step further down my speculation rabbit hole, it'd be even cooler if there were vampire versions of, say, the Celestial Palace Guard, since the Depth Guard were such a badass invention by CA. And since I'm already sort of getting ahead of myself with the mechanics, let's switch gears to the mechanics for a proposed faction, or a proposed faction name, of the Jade Blooded. Now, Harakati was the Chief Justice and High Executioner of the Deathless Court of Lamia, and the Jade Vampires in specific have had schemes stretching over a thousand years as they plot and scheme. This is a much less overt bloodline than the rest, uh, relying almost entirely on working with agents in the shadows and rarely even being seen in the flesh except by a vaunted few. So what if the mechanic revolved around the 900 strictures, the code of laws that was created by Harakati and was enforced in Lamia? This would be a system that looks at the public order and then the corruption of a city that would then allow you to enact quote-unquote laws. 
these laws would grant you bonuses and penalties based off of certain criteria. Now, what's the one thing we all try to do? High public order and minimal corruption in all of our settlements, right? Barring the playthroughs where you want faction-specific corruption, of course. But what if these strictures were not just simply for having high public order and low corruption? What if they ranged? Okay, so you have low public order here. Well, you can enact a martial law stricture that will reduce growth significantly, but will increase military production in the province and perhaps you know upgrade your units, whatever kind of other bonuses like that. But maybe you have a high public order and you can pull the strings to increase trade production at the cost of public order or even maybe military production. This sort of balance where you're manipulating the state of each and every province to your will. And this can be taken a step further and be used on the enemy to help reduce their neighboring town's effectiveness. Uh, maybe some of the strictures give you a bonus, but have a line that say, all neighboring enemy provinces have minus 10 public order for 10 turns. These strictures could be viewed similar to rights, or just chosen from a menu with a unique resource that they pull from. Building a spy network or, or something of the sort, you know, that's the kind of uh, means for that uh, unique resource, you know, creating agents, manipulating connections, whatever they want to call it. Now, outside of the faction specific mechanics, I think that this shouldn't be a hybrid faction or else you're pigeonholed into one pure Cathay faction, even though the Monkey King, in my speculation here, is pretty pure for the most part. What I think is that this is a normal Cathay faction, but with a with units completely subbed out. Vampire Celestial Guard rather than the standard ones, Jade Cultists versus Bannermen, etc, etc. Most of the time, hybrid factions have all of the units of their parent faction, plus some minor ones from another roster. This way you get a better synthesis for an army, and it's just a little bit more unique and different. Now, lastly, again, for a starting location, we could be looking at Southern Cathay or Han Kuo, the absolutely not Korean peninsula to the east of Cathay. I mean, it really just depends on how far east CA wants to go with the map and how much of Cathay they want to include in it. It gives a, a different but also Cathayan starting region in that it's not connected by the Great Bastion, so chaos incursions from the north could be a huge part of the campaign. From this point on though, the video will start to speed up. I think talking about the legendary lords, their mechanic, lore, starting positions, everything is such a necessary bit to be very detailed about, but the rest of what we know from the roster of Cathay, or what we are supposing from the roster of Cathay, is mainly small sentences within the lore of either the aforementioned legendary lords, or quick throwaway blurbs on the left and right sides of pages of all the sources we've talked about up into this point. So expect less lore talk and more game mechanic speculation from this point forward. Let's start in on just the new, or I'm sorry, just the standard lords. The Celestial Warlords are essentially the Elector Counts of Grand Cathay, each one ruling their own land under the Divine Emperor, who they then pay fealty to. In game, I could see these guys as a standard Empire General, but with some more exciting mounted weapon loadouts. I really like how Kobol Yu has drafted these guys, with a trident and a recurve bow, which could give us two options to choose from, ranged or polearm, much like we get with a lot of the other Warhammer 2 generic lords having a little bit of variance or at least one or two options. Then, for mounts, a horse, Jade Lion, Ki Rin, all make a lot of really awesome sense and give the character a lot of punching power. Want your lord to be a shock cav polearm beast? Take that jade lion. Ranged agile lord? Go with the key rin. The first caster of Cathay is the Shunjanan Sorcerer, and in Cathayan society, they have to be licensed to be able to practice magic for the armies and courts. Not sure if that could somehow play into a mechanic, but figure I'd bring it up as an interesting tidbit. But there are plenty of random lore excerpts in the Dark Elves Army book or the Tamarcon about Cathayan sorcerers summoning massive tidal waves or hurling white fire and blizzards of murderous ice shards. Now, I know we look at ice magic in the scope of Kislev, but that could hint to a special Cathay-only lore of magic. Uh, I'll just call it lore of celestial magic because I'm uninventive. But mechanics-wise, it's a caster, so there's no real mystery here. But I do think that a unique lore has to exist to really get a benefit. Mount options could include a hand cart or Cathayan uh, rickshaw, and then the litter or palanquin, something we quickly glossed over with the Herakati. 
Now, of all the generic lords, the Celestial Astromancer probably has the least to go off of, with very little entries, but this one could be a fun support style character that relies on buffing armies. They're all about reading the signs, as it were, so they could confer perhaps a map-wide passive buff based off of the winds and magic of the surrounding area. Give them access to the lore of heavens and then a few other items or skills that help out the army, and it could be a very interesting thematic lord. On the other hand, the Jade Vampires would be a very different breed of vampire, like I said earlier. The Jade Blooded very rarely take part in combat. In fact, it is against the strictures to do so, as it says it is best done by others. The lore talks about how they emit a poisonous vapor and a wasting plague that chokes those around them. So if there's a Nurgle mechanic for persistent damage a la poison, similar to a Mortis Engine effect, we could definitely see that extended to the Jade Vampire. Further, giving them an active ability to vanish into a poison mist is not entirely unheard of. A short distance warp leaving a cloud of damage behind them could be a really cool escape effect. But I worry about that being too similar to, you know, like a MOBA. So it needs to have a very limited range and practical recycle so you're not just warping all over the place trying to get skill shots off. Mounts wise, I could go, or I'd say, I think, uh, going with a similar approach to the sorcerer and give them access to lore of death, Vampires, Shadows, the typical fare, uh, nothing too crazy. But what makes them unique is that jade-blooded poison that would allow them to deal poison damage and do it in an area around them. Our last generic lord is one that might be gated by the other factions except for Dian Ching. It'd be a cool bit of flavor to add to his faction, I'd say, actually. Even further, he can, can't take jade vampires as a trade-off. Maybe that's how they kind of reason it. But the argument could even be made that the last three characters we talked about are faction-specific versus allowed by all the armies of Cathay. But the Master Magus of Qian Chi is essentially a spiritual stand-in for Zinch and guardian of the cult's lore. These guys act as the heads of each individual cell of the Purple Hands. And with that, I think we basically have a Zinch sorcerer in the Kinthean army. Entirely unique, but nothing overly hard to crack. Give them a horse and a Disc of Zinch mount option, add, adding to that Chaos Cultist spice, and just call it a day. The hero section for Cathay is just like most of the other factions, so you should see a lot of repeat versions of the Lord level units just watered down with agent-specific uses in mind. So let's just kind of dive on into this. And the Emperor's Champion is our first hero, and no, he is not a Black Templar covered in power armor. But there's not a ton of info about them in the lore outside of a cool excerpt from White Dwarf 231 that talks about an Emperor's Champion, Tong Po, who kills Hablo Khan, one of the leaders of the Hobgoblin Cognate. But, I mean, the title of Emperor's Champion was too cool to pass up. And I'd look at these guys as heavy armor, heavy AP character killers. And what would be even cooler is if they give a leadership and defensive bonus to those around them, filling the men with courage as they see the champion of their own emperor carving a path through the enemy. But there's a trade-off. If the emperor champ emperor's champion dies, there's an immediate leadership debuff because they conversely just watch the champion of their own emperor get carved like a cake. So a very physical support hero granting guardian, and let's just call the other passive emperor's light. Why? Because I already told you I'm just unimaginative. But moving into the caster, the Cathayan Sage, uh, could simply just be uh, Shunjenin Sorcerer. Nothing crazy here, give him the same mount options and call it a day. I don't really think you need to go over the top here with the Sage. And again, for the Cathayan Captain, just simply an Empire Captain, but Cathay. Just a solid, tanky hero unit with similar mount options, Sans maybe the key Rin, so it just so it's kind of just between a horse and a Jade Lion. You could even throw a chariot into the mix now that I think about it, uh, between both the Cathayan Captain and the Cathayan Warlord, so they have that anti-infantry threat range, much, much like we get with the uh, High Elf Noble and Prince, so that kind of nice, uh, uh, I guess, mobility. Now, we're getting into some spicier options, and the Cathayan Assassin could be a lot of fun. Kobal Yu has beautifully rendered these guys with the Flying Guillotine, and I think that's such an awesome addition to an Assassin class. I could see it being implemented in one of two ways. Either you can only target a Lord or Hero that is below 15% health, and it kills them outright, or it's just an active ability with maybe two or three charges that does a significant amount of damage. 
okay, I, I actually, I kind of lied here. Maybe there's a third option where it does more damage the more health that a single hero or lord is missing, allowing you to have an option for some damage in the beginning if you need to, but saving it for the later, or I'm sorry, latter, uh, allows for a harder hit. And mechanically, outside of that, it would have the smoke bombs that Clan Eshin Assassins do because that's how they learned about them. But when it comes to the weapon loadout of the Cathayan Assassins, I thought about how awesome it would be if these guys were unarmed rather than using a weapon. Uh, the Warhammer RPG gives a bonus if these guys are unarmed, and I love to see that reflected of these, as these kind of devastating martial artists. But the biggest problem with that is that if an assassin character is going to be truly effective, it needs armor piercing, or else the heavy armor of a lord or hero just negates it. So maybe they can work around that and say that the, the, the hits are just that devastating. Otherwise, it's standard fare. AP, anti-infantry, poison, poison loadout that we've seen on assassins so far. Our last hero, though, is still a cool one. And I think as far as explanations go, it's a real simple one. This guy would really be no different than a Master Magus of Qian Chi. The Purple Hand Mages all acted under the Maguses and were trained by them. So this would just simply be a lesser Magus without maybe an arcane conduit, perhaps. But again, very similar to the Lord option. Switching gears into the roster, we'll talk about the melee infantry first. And not to repeat myself, but we're going to be able to get even faster in these sections, or this next section at least. I want to gloss over units that are self-explanatory so we can bank time to really talk about some of the juicier ones. This isn't just for the melee infantry, but the roster as a whole. We've got a ton to go through, so again, as I always say, let's dive on in. First up, the Bannermen act as the base state troop of Cathay, and they are jam-packed with tons of variants, much like a lot of the latter factions in Warhammer 2 having different versions of the same unit, we would get the same here with the Bannermen. Very much a toolkit unit, they can be applied to almost any situation. Both Ruo Yu and Kobol Yu have drafted beautiful renditions of these guys, so you can see those as we talk through this. And on the very bottom level, we'd have to have just a base sword and shield variant. Silver rank shields as they have uh, particularly large tower shields with a moderate amount of armor. I guess the big question here though is how would Cathay's army be done? Are we talking base units that are actually quite decent or are we talking empire state troop level of quality? That's a distinction that has to be made because having more expensive, higher quality troops makes for a narrower army versus say empire state troops, which can go quite wide since they're so inexpensive. Moving up the ladder though, we'd see bannermen with pikes granting a cheap anti-large. Now with a term like pikes, which the lore directly references in the End Times book of Archeon by Rob Sanders, we get a longer weapon than a standard spear. So I wonder if they'll take that literally or just make them spearmen and call it a day. In the same passage, we get this really awesome bit for Feng Shen Ku, the warlord of the Hundun Marauder Clan and his special sword clans. With their black lacquered armor, pairs of curved long swords and iron masks forged in expressions of horror and dismay, Feng Shen Ku and the sworn clan of the dreaded woe were a dark and determined force. So whether dual wooding swords would be a variant or just a really awesome regiment and renown, it's hard to say, but it's definitely worth bringing up here. The last variant I want to discuss is Bannermen with pole arms or a dagger axe. This could also be called a G if they want to take that route, but this would give us an AP anti-large unit for Cathay on the bottom tier that is an elite like the soon to be discussed Celestial Palace Guard. And very similar to what we see in Bretonnia and the Empire already, so it fits a similar uni uh, unit trajectory of those factions. But let's move into some more elite units. The Palace Guard are referenced in the rulebook of the 7th edition and the old 5th edition Dogs of War as heavily armored warriors that support the well-disciplined rank and file of Cathay. Kobol Yu has imagined them in these beautiful renditions as Palace Guards and Bastion Sentinels, a possible regiment of renown for the Celestial Palace Guard as he stays. And these could then have three different variants, a sword or axe and shield one, like with the Bastion Sentinels that Kobol Yu has drawn for us, then a greatsword variant, giving us an anti-infantry heavy AP unit, and it's also the picture that we see in the 7th edition rulebook. And then the third variant is one I think 
like we've already seen hinted at with the Deathmaster Snitch DLC in the Eshin Triads. If we look at their unit card, they're specifically referred to as Guandao Infantry. Now, I love if this was the hint for a Celestial Palace Guard with pole arms wielding huge Guandao and delivering tons of AP anti-large damage while simultaneously looking badass in the process. Jumping back to our conversation on Herakati, these three could all then have a vampire variant that have hunger mixed in just like the Depth Guard, making them absolutely ferocious on the battlefield. The Celestial Dragon Monks is our first unit in the army that is really going to break away from the standard human faction construct of being somewhat recognizable from Bretonia or Empire, or, or even Three Kingdoms if you want to make that correlation. Think of these guys as basically the movie adaptation of Shaolin Monks, but with a mastery of the elements tied into it. And I'd love to see that incorporated into these guys. Envision a unit that has low armor, high melee defense, innate physical resistance, and then give them magic and flaming attacks as they have mastered these elemental techniques. Couple that together with anti-infantry and you have this really thematic blender unit that uses its own fists to do damage rather than weapons. A first for Total War outside of the obvious monstrous units that slam things with their bare hands. But I love these guys and I think they'd make for such an awesome thematic unit. Uh, imagine looking over the battlefield to see their attack animations having flaming kicks, lightning punches, just over-the-top avatar-style attacks that could really add a lot of devastating melee punch to the army. A pun not really intended, but it works. Now, for the, some vampire units, I have two thoughts here. The Jade Cultist would be a very low-tier Chaff-style expendable unit. The Warhammer RPG 2nd Edition talks about Jade-blooded armies of zealous warriors fleshed out with huge ranks of zombies and whites, so the Cultists could be more akin to ghouls than whites. Remember, the Grave Guard are whites, so they're a stronger bit of undead than your standard Rotting Boy. But then we see a passage in the End Times Return of Nagash that references the ghoul cabals of Cathay, so I think the cultists could essentially be Cathay and ghouls, giving a nice, cheap, but effective unit for jade-blooded faction we talked about earlier. Or the zealots, I could easily just see this as being Cathay and graveguard, modeled similarly in a fashion that fits the aesthetic of Cathay. But there is an argument that could be made. If there was vampire celestial guard, that they would create a redundancy, and in that case, the Jade Zealots could simply be low armor, dual wielding anti infantry units that are meant to be a blender style unit than an actual tanky unit. This way, the celestial guard have a better and more true place in a Jade blooded roster. And perhaps even the Jade Zealots would replace celestial dragon monks in that Jade blooded roster. Pivoting over to the ranged infantry, we go back to our beloved Bannerman, and there's three variants that we have references from in the lore. Both the 5th edition Lizardman Army book and the Tamarcon book both give us evidence of bows and crossbows that the Bannerman could utilize, granting some great armor-piercing range units. In my opinion, I think that this could just be narrowed down to only the bow, as crossbow creates a redundancy in the next variant, which is the repeating crossbow. So you get that full-on Dark Elf flavor, but far off on the other side of the world. And I think that this is a really exciting option for Cathay, as repeater crossbows are one of the best range units when it comes to infantry or on horseback. So giving them another outlet in Cathay is a cool prospect. The next range option is a bit more exciting. The Dragon Stave or Fire Stick Handgunners would essentially be your standard handgunner unit that fires in a fashion similar to the Napoleonic style of warfare, where in the front row takes a knee, the second row crouches, and the third row stands tall to fire. This could just simply be a handgunner unit though and be done with it, you know, do armor piercing and move on. But it would be cool if the Cathayan handgunners differed from Imperial handgunners in two ways. One, their range is longer, and they take longer to fire in between volleys. But their volleys are more uniformed. So you might get three or four full volleys off by the time a unit makes contact with your line, but you're ultimately putting the same, if not more, bullets down range. The trade-off here is that if the unit is interrupted by a rear charge or anything of the sort, that, that, that next volley isn't going to come, obviously. I think it'd be a really cool balancing act where you have the potential for higher damage, but just at a slower rate, and it helps to differentiate between Imperial and Cathayan handgunners. 
Now that we've talked about these standard or regular style range units, I think a stalking irregular style like Shadow Warriors is due for Cathay. And the Hill Tribesmen make for a great option here, as the 7th edition rulebook that talks about the Celestial Palace Guard also mentions fierce hill people in the same sentence. Kobol Yu does a great rendition of them with very ornate yet light armor. I also like the double crossbow that they have as well, which we'll see reflected in an actual artillery piece soon. But give these guys stalk, snipe, and maybe frenzy for the potential to do some ferocious melee combat. One mark I, I always feel is missed when it comes to, say, shades or shadow warriors is that they were actually pretty decent in combat, or pretty decent combatants, in tabletop. So, I'd love to see the hill tribesmen be that triple threat. Stock, ranged, with good melee stats. So one unit I've always really loved is the zombie pirate deckhand bombers of the Vampire Coast. They are devastating, but paper thin. I think they're the perfect balance of sheer destructive glass cannon, and that's exactly what I envision with Dragon Hunter bombers. In the novel Burning Shore by Robert Earl, one of my favorite Warhammer books, might I add, there is a passage that talks about powder weapons of great power. And in a direct quote, they were, all the way from Cathay, where they use them to hunt dragons. So, with that in mind, these could simply be explosives with some nice AP characteristic, but it'd be very unique if they were anti-large, geared towards bringing down large entities, and less so towards clearing out fields of units. Things that all the other range units will be able to do in spades. And we already kind of get this with Skaven, right? They have their anti-large um, Globadiers. But, what will be very crucial though is if we're taking a look at the scope of game three there are going to be a lot of anti-large units so having these dragon hunter bombers which would do anti-large damage is really going to be nice when it comes to dealing with bear calf demonic units the entire ogre kingdom's roster um anything from the chaos dwarfs that is monstrous so the dragon hunters could be a really nice touch for cathay range units Infantry units, all of them pale in comparison to my favorite unit of any army is cavalry. And the Cathayan Horsemen is our first set into the world of, well, non-monstrous cavalry. I really see these as maybe slightly weaker silver helms or perhaps tougher Illyrian Reavers. Definitely not the same speed, but a higher armor profile with different loadouts. One variant could simply have a polearm or spear, uh, the entry level meant for charging into the fray and disrupting backlines. Another variant could use repeater crossbows from the range section, giving that mobile ranged platform. Then the last variant could have short range fire sticks, sort of like pistoliers with grenade launchers, but the twist is that they do devastating damage on the charge and are meant to actually engage in melee versus being relegated to skirmishing. I think this could make for a real powerful harassment unit that does have a, a deadly ramification if left unchecked. Of course, them being lightly armored, persistent combat would be dangerous, which is why our next option makes sense if you want to get into the thick of the melee. The Knights of Cathay would be the real heavy-hitting shock cavalry of the army, highly durable with two different options. The Knights of the Lion have sword and shields for a persistent close combat centric heavy cavalry force. And that was a lot to say in one, in one mouthful. The Knights of the Mirror could use a Guandao if we want to get real frisky, or just simply a spear and a shield for a more shock cavalry focused unit, designed to do high damage on the charge, with perhaps a bonus versus large, adding some additional punch. Sprinkling nomads into the Cathayan roster is also not a terrible idea. This gives us an option to explore a perhaps cheaper, faster, and more effective quote-unquote fast cav option compared to the Cathayan horsemen. If Creative Assembly wanted to make the Cathayan horsemen more silver helms or Empire Knight style, then the mercenary nomads could fit that cheaper fast cav option with mounted archers and lances in just two simple variants. Our last cavalry unit, though, would be the dreaded chariot, something that we've seen in plenty of armies across Total War and used to great effect on infantry-centered armies. It has a really nice flavor touch to it, and it actually, in a Warmaster Trial Armies compendium, it was an option for a sage to be used as a mount. Extending the chariot as a mount option to the lords and heroes is another really solid choice here, but I'm not sure if Creative Assembly will take that leap, and it's why I've waited until this point to even bring it up. 
It might them thematically kind of clash with a lot of the other units in the army, but it does have a lore precedence for its existence, and I think it would be fun regardless. Despite everyone knowing how much I hate chariots, you can thank Turn for that. Nobody trolls Throg. But again, it's a chariot, nothing really crazy here, nothing really over the top. You could use some fire sticks on here if you wanted to make this a ranged chariot as well, giving it some AP, uh, mobile range damage, but for the most part, it's just a simple chariot. Let's move on to some of the bigger and heavier hitting things in the army. The bronze cannon isn't anything crazy on paper. In the Tamarcon book, we get this little blurb. The cannon spat forth clusters of bronze javelins, which showered through the onrushing beastmen. So Creative Assembly could interpret this as a standard cannon with a really awesome thematic housing and just move on from there. Single shot cannonball with AP. Or it does shoot a hail of javelins, and it's more of an anti-infantry powerhouse. They could go with just the simple cannon, but judging off of the next entry, I think the shower of bronze javelins could be really awesome. Because the triple bow ballista is exactly what it sounds like. A ballista that shoots a very high AP single projectile downrange. The three bows help to add to the punching power. In Warmaster, it reduced the armor of those that it shot at. So this could be unlike any other ballista. Rather than having alternative firing modes, it has a highly accurate, high AP, shorter range single shot that is meant to just skewer things. You get the extra AP from the triple bows, but offset that bonus with a shorter range. This could be uh, particularly deadly as ballistas previously are quite accurate and great at sniping things out if used properly so it could be really devastating in the cathayan roster and it gives you the high ap single target shot artillery piece with the ballista and you get the ap um, anti-infantry piece with the bronze cannon our last artillery piece the emperor's skyrockets we've already seen implemented in the empire in the hellstorm rocket battery and that's quite all right since the hellstorm rocket battery is what influenced hermann falkenstein to make it in the first place after seeing the fireworks display by a cathayan emissary and outdorf so i don't really think you need to go crazy here just match the cathayan aesthetic and make a glorious rocket battery with dragon-headed rockets thunder down range Speaking of thundering down range, though, let's get into the monstrous infantry and all the fun options there. Observe all ye who walk here. This is an exact rendition of me without a shirt. Hairy and disgusting. The monkey warriors would be armored beater of worlds. I see these things as armored monstrous infantry units in the same vein as, say, crypt horrors charging into combat with frenzy to garlic maces, as Kobold calls them, or maybe even a mace and a shield, giving you some options just like what we get with minotaurs. There could be a third option that gives these guys great weapons, that way the Monkey King has a lot more variants in his army than just one standard unit of Monkey Warriors. You get a weapon shield variant, a dual weapon for anti-infantry, and a great weapon for bonus versus large AP style damage. I'm really excited to see how CA envisions these because the 6th edition rulebook talks about strange Monkey Warriors living high in the mountains of heaven. There's really tons of ways that could be interpreted. Now, as far as ogres go, there are two different types, just simple one-horned ogres that act as the mercenaries of the Empire in the earlier times, before the coming of the Great Maw and the curse the Dragon Emperor placed upon the ogres. Now, I don't think there needs to be a ton of varieties of these guys, since the next entry is a specialized one. But these could essentially be animated hulks, since those are ogre models, but given a wide range of weapons without particular focuses. Uh, just anti-infantry focused killing machines with a really high charge bonus. And of the ogres that serve in the armies of Cathay, ogre sword masters are one-horned ogres that have served a long enough time to be granted a Cathayan longsword. The 6th edition Ogre Kingdom's army book actually has this as a weapon you can equip your characters with, remarking that they are mastercrafted blades that are of great value to the ogres because they will remain eternally sharp. So this could be done as one of two ways. Just have a higher armored unit of one-horned ogres with these with a the different uh, damage profile. But... I think it might be cooler to see them as a single entity swordmaster with high AP, anti-large damage, able to dish out a ton of damage with a devastating charge and heavy hitting longsword. 
Now that we've talked about so many actual monsters, it's time to get into some of the fun constructs of Cathay. And the Terracotta Automatons is really a good first step. I really love the lore for these guys. In the 8th edition rulebook, there's a little side paragraph about the Siege of the Great Bastion in 1310, and how hordes of Chaos Warriors battle legions of Terracotta Automatons attempting to shore up the Great Wall with their clay bodies. It's such an awesome bit of imagery, and, and I hope we get to see it in Total War Warhammer. I think these guys have to be relatively static in their armament. Give them a high magic and physical resist perhaps, but just shield and a weapon with a slow plodding movement speed as they march down range. Perhaps even high missile resist and silver shields so that they're really a hard target to crack open, but they're also an incredibly slow one. Essentially make the fact that they're such tanks become their weakness because they lack the maneuverability to try and get away from focused missile fire. You could even actually make them have uh, resist, or I'm sorry, a... Um, penalty to resistance against fire. For the monstrous cavalry section, we have two entries, and they're quite exciting prospects. The Jade Lion, and we've talked about this a little bit before, is a massive beast that guards the temples of the gods of Cathay. Both Kobol Yu and Ruo Yu do amazing renditions of these guys, and I have an idea for both in their own regard. Ruo Yu's artwork gives off an almost Tomb Scorpion vibe, which I think would make for a really interesting single entity splashing around wildly doing magic anti-infantry attacks as it becomes harder to pin down in melee with its attack animations. So a very larger scale unit, more kind of like, I say Tomb Scorpion, but maybe if we kind of think about it, it's more in the line of the Sphinx that we get from the Tomb Kings. So kind of an in-between in size and usability. Following the Jade Lion up, we would have Kobol Yu's interpretation with the Temple Dog and consequently Temple Dog Riders. So a smaller version of the Jade Lion and, well, a dog and not a lion for one. This would give us something more akin to a Demogriff Knights. And I think that's at home with the units we can expect with Game 3. Bear Cavalry, Blood and Skull Crushers of Corn. This is just Cathay's answer to those. Essentially, you'd be looking at a heavily armored Celestial Temple Guard on top of Temple Dogs with a range of weapons. Two Sword Breakers, as Kobol illustrates, giving heavy AP punching power, and then perhaps a Guan Dao for anti-large AP with magic attacks coming from the Temple Dog itself. Both of these are very thematic and gorgeous options, but let's get into our last set of units in the Monsters of Cathay. We're opening up strong with the Onyx Crowmen. These things have a brutal appearance in the Tamarcon book with this quote. Sale watched on in grim fascination with his witch's sight as great minotaurs were dragged bellowing and helpless into the air by living statues of Onyx, neither raven nor man in shape, and gutted by glittering talons. Just listen to how metal that is. Another construct that bears its way, or sorry, tears its way through the enemy, only this time on onyx black wings, swooping down into the foe. These things definitely aren't slouches if they're able to lift an entire minotaur too, so I see them as a monstrous flyer unit akin to Vargeists with AP damage. It'd be cool if they also had an active ability that gave them an AP and charge bonus called swoop or something of the sort. Uh, you click it and it either activates for a duration or it's a targeted ability where you select an enemy unit and they directly move to attack that unit, giving them the bonus to their profile as they screech towards the foe. For the other monsters, we have the Ki Rin and or Chi Lin Knights or Riders. Both are really good possibilities with small unit counts, sort of like Hippogriff Knights out of Bretonia. Very high AP, very high damage flyers that rely on being rather tanky. And of course, again, a small unit count of around two or three. These would be similar to the Temple Dog Riders, but I'd argue a tier above in durability and with the added bonus of flying. Now with both of these monsters, uh, Chi Lin and Ki Rin, we don't get a conventional flyer with wings. So it'll be interesting to see how CA tackles animating these without making them look too wonky or stupid. But I think it's a unit with a lot of awesome character. The, the Ki Rin has been one of my favorite Japanese folklore creatures since my days in Ultima Online. And they have a presence in the third edition rulebook as a race near and dear to Cathay. So I'd love to see them added in. Now, the Celestial Dragon I've put in this section, despite the fact that the Immortal Dragon Emperor can turn into one. We see these discussed in the same blurb that talks about the Temple Dogs of mysterious serpentine dragons, or in the Siege of the Great Bastion we talked about earlier from the 8th edition army book. 
It talks about how demon princes dueled with bejeweled gold dragons. So we could just simply see gold dragons, but I think taking the approach of the serpentine dragon is the right call. And I'm so fired up at just the notion of these things granting all three of my wishes after collecting the dragon balls. Come on, you think I didn't? I, I would miss the opportunity to do that bad joke? Mm, I didn't. But as far as unit mechanics go, I, I just see this as a dragon, perhaps with a more engine effect doing damage to everything around it when it lands, but I, I think we have to see a little bit more about any possible new mechanics with Game 3 to really get an idea of how they might do a Celestial Dragon. I'm not opposed to them taking more ideas from the Storm of Magic supplement that they've already used in the past. Here you get the rules for how Ice Dragons or Venom Dragons breath attacks actually affect the units that they hit with. But we also get rules for doomed fire dragons who get to pull from the lore of fire, or the nightmare dragons who can pull from the lore of death. So what if the celestial dragons got special bound spells from the lore of celestial magic that I'll speculate about further or later in this video, with a special breath attack that was a cascading waterfall of all the elements in a glorious shower of destruction. All right, the final entries are really fun here, and the Dragon Turtle is just an awesome unit that Kobol Yu has revived from the depths of the first edition of Warhammer RPG, but in this crushing artillery piece sort of way. In the RPG, the Dragon Turtle is basically just an aquatic dragon, nothing cool or special about it, but I love this notion of the Dragon Turtle filling the same niche as the Stegodons from the Lizardmen roster. This gigantic pagoda-themed howdah on their back with just a crushing amount of ordnance. Emperor Skyrocket variant, a triple bow ballista variant, or even a bronze cannon variant. I think it can be just as simple as that. And the turtle itself is just a massive AP anti-infantry, just like the Stegodon. You could also give it high armor with a good amount of missile resistance from just, you know, its shell. But hear me out on this. An activatable where the turtle goes into its shell and gets 90% physical resistance, but it cannot move, obviously. So it becomes a veritable turret on the battlefield. Hard to displace, but immobile and easily surrounded. One thing I worry about with it being, you know, too slow moving is that if it's well, too slow moving, then it will just get blasted off the table and will never be used properly. So there has to be a balance to its speed and tankiness. Perhaps the activatable is that balance. Go into shell mode and act as a defensive structure to rally around. Then you don't need to worry about moving. Speaking of slow moving monsters, the Brass Titan is a glorious fan made construct from Matthias Ellison's personal army book project, where he created army lists for Cathay, Nippon, Ind, Araby, Amazons, so on and so forth. And Josh Reynolds took the idea and semi canonized it with his sort of quote unquote afterwards that he did on Ask.fm about the end times, remarking that the Brass Titans helped fight back the massive chaos invasions into Cathay before fleeing into the sea with the Dragon Emperor's forces. So I picture this massive construct, something that we get with the Herophant Titan, but rather than laser eyes, a massive Guandao. And just how Kobol Yu illustrates it, flames cascading off this thing like an enormous effigy of war, smoke billowing from its back, you know, just really, really awesome. High armor, high AP splash damage with fire attacks just being hurled from this engine of destruction. I think it's one of the most exciting illustrations because of the possibilities for this thing are incredible. And we've definitely seen something similar with the Herophant Titan already, so it's absolutely in the cards. All right, the end of our roster, and what a journey it has been, but the elementals would conclude this list. Each one summonable onto the battlefield, water, fire, air, and earth. Now, I'm concerned about roster bloat here. I mean, I've mentioned so many things. So these things could be something that is bound to say a right or an ability within Cathay's mechanics, allowing you to bring them to the battlefield, maybe in the event of a siege, or again, a specific right that allows you to select one to be summoned onto the battlefield. The air elemental could be fast, high physical resist, frenzy, uh, maybe flying, who knows. The earth elemental could be very similar to an effigy of Gork and, and or Mork, um, only smaller with that same kind of cascading profile the more damage it receives. Fire elementals could be ranged, hurling fireballs, sort of like the salamanders of the lizardmen. Then lastly, the water elementals could be sort of like a cavalry piece, using a high charge bonus from crashing into the enemy like a tsunami. In fact, they could ha even have a bound ability that is basically the wave attack from the lore of the depths. All of these could make for a very fun addition to the army in a pinch, where a little extra is needed to round the army out or grant you some much needed magic damage here and there.
We've done it. We made our entire way through all of proposed units for Cathay. Now, it's important to remember that I'm pulling a lot of information from a lot of obscure resources to give you a rough idea of what an army in the Far East could look like. There's nothing to say that any of this is even usable to Creative Assembly. They could be completely making a new list from the ground up with very little of the original lore as precedence. It seems to be that they're working with Games Workshop to make an entirely homebrewed faction, unlike anything we've seen before. With the Vampire Coast, there was a at least a working skeleton of a list to work off of. Cathay is unique in that it doesn't really have that, which brings up the lores of magic. As far as what Cathay would have access to, the base lores we're all familiar with are no-brainers. Lores of fire, heavens, life, and shadows. There's even evidence of those throughout the Tamarcon, throughout the Gotrek and Felix book, Kin Eater. Um, so there's at least that presence of them, or even the lore of stealth in the second edition Warhammer RPG in the Children of the Horned Rat. But we would also be seeing lore of Zinch on any of the Purple Hands allied units, lords, or characters, then death and vampires from the Jade Blooded. But then we have to discuss high and dark magic. There's an item called the Cathayan Jet in, again, the 6th edition Ogre Kingdom's Army book that grants ward saves to all forms of magic minus high and dark magic. So it makes you wonder if we'll even get high and or dark magic in the lands of Cathay, since they seem to have tapped into magic much earlier than their empire counterparts. Even further, I'd love if they gave Cathay that special unique lore I was talking about earlier in the video, lore of celestial magic. I could it, or I'm sorry, it could combine a lot of elemental effects from a lot of different schools, blending that mastery of the elements that we get very present in the culture of Cathay while having a wide range of buffs, debuffs, direct damage, and healing abilities. Just a nice, unique touch for the army to help diversify them in the grand scope of things. If we think about the launch races, if Cathay doesn't get its own magic, or I'm sorry, unique magic, then it will be the only race to not get one. Kislev gets Lore of Ice, Chaos Demons get the respective lores of Slanesh, Zinch, and Nurgle, then the Chaos Dwarfs get the lore of Hashut, and the Ogre Kingdoms get lore of the Great Maw. So it stands to reason that we could see a homebrewed lore of Cathay that fits with the theme of the army and completes their roster package. And at that, we have come to a close of this massive speculative roster for Cathay. As I said earlier, this is really just looking at a lot of the amazing illustrations created by Kobol Yu and Ruo Yu, looking at some passages in the lore and having my mind run wild. There's very little basis for any of this because, as I've said, all this lore is just so on the sidelines. Dian Chiing is probably one of the most fleshed out portions of this entire list because he is featured enough in the Vampire Genevieve books and the Warhammer community hint regarding his possible presence. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Are there any units here that I missed that you'd love to see? Do you think I'm totally off base with all this? Do you think I nailed it? I'd love to get a dialogue going as we seem to have quite a bit of time until game three is coming out and there's plenty of speculative content to cover. If you want to dive deeper into the rabbit hole, please don't forget to check out a lot of the amazing content that's coming out from people such as Loremaster of Sotek, Milk and Cookies Total War, and Great Book of Grudges. Everyone is on this hype train and we're having a great time producing content for you guys so be on the lookout for more to come in the future and one last reminder to use my nexus store link if you haven't pre-purchased warhammer 3 and as always thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care